And uh, next we have JJ Aramis. I mentioned JJ is at Boston University. He's an expert on white dwarfs, and today um, he's going to tell us a little bit about um, what do white dwarfs reveal about rocky exoplanets and exoasteroids. JJ, take it away. Okay, great. Thanks, Matteo. Uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Uh, I will try to keep an eye on the chat, um, but uh, as Matteo mentions, if you would like to ask a question, feel free to just unmute yourself and interrupt me uh, or, uh, or ask something in the chat. I think one of the things I'm gonna miss about teaching on Zoom, there's not much I'm gonna miss about teaching on Zoom, but one of the things I'm gonna miss is the fact that many students who are reluctant to raise their hands can actually ask anonymous questions uh, in the chat on Zoom. And I, I would love for us to figure out a way to keep that alive uh, when we start going back in person. Because uh, I know there are a lot of students that are reluctant to ask questions. Uh, anyway, um, I'm gonna talk about something that's very uh, specific that white dwarfs can help constrain. Uh, Mike gave a great introduction to white dwarf stars. Mike was actually my co-advisor for my PhD at the University of Texas. And I am fortunate enough to have started a white dwarf group at Boston University, where I'm on the faculty now. Uh, and so if you'd like to check out some more that my group is working on, uh, you, can, you can check us out here. So I'm going to talk about uh, an area of white dwarf research that I am relatively new to, but uh, am growing an interest in. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll understand why I am growing an interest in it, because it, white dwarfs can actually help us constrain things about rocky exoplanets and even exoasteroids, that is asteroids in solar systems other than our own, uh, through relatively simple means. Uh, and so this is a really interesting and growing field uh, in astrophysics, uh, is using white dwarf stars to help us learn something about the actual rocky composition of material outside of our solar system. And so I'll motivate this by um, thinking about the, the dark future of the Earth in our solar system. It's always great to start at home. And so here is a, a cartoon of our solar system. Uh, I'm stealing this blatantly from Boris Gansik, uh, who's at the University of Warwick and has done a lot of work on uh, planets around white dwarfs. And so this is what our solar system looks like today. Uh, our sun is nice, it's happily burning hydrogen to helium in its core on the main sequence. It's about four and a half billion years old. Uh, here's our, our lovely solar system. Uh, but over time, our sun will become more and more luminous. It'll grow in radius, uh, and eventually it'll become a giant star. And the physical extent of the sun in about 5 billion years will reach all the way out to near Earth's orbit. So it's actually uh, something that we don't have great expectations for. Earth may actually be right on the outside, uh, outside of, of survivability here. Uh, but long before that, all of our oceans will boil off. Uh, Earth will be a terrible place to go. Uh, interestingly, in this phase, the, uh, the amount of, of radiation that we get from the sun now in our orbit will exist uh, around the moons of Jupiter. Uh, and so uh, there will be habitable moons in our solar system even during this phase. And so, you know, we certainly have the technology to pick up and move. Uh, there are certain... Um, billionaires on our planet who, who have this uh, seeming desire to move us all to Mars. Uh, but, uh, you know, at some point, billions of years from now, we, we, we will need to, to make this, this great migration, uh, at least within our solar system. But that's far off into the future. We're talking hundreds of millions of years before things really, uh, really get dire. Uh, I also think it's worth mentioning that when you bring this up, to, to students or, or people in the community, a lot of times people have a sense of fatalism about uh, climate change and global warming because eventually the sun will bake our planet. Um, but all of the temperature rise that's happening right now on our planet uh, is not because of a change in solar flux or solar output. So uh, we have very good, get good data now to say that that global warming that's happening right now is, is happening because of, of increases in greenhouse gases on our planet. Um, but five billion years from now, our, our sun will evolve. It'll expand in size. And as it does that, it starts to lose more and more of its outer layers. Uh, 
And we will end up with a white dwarf star in our solar system. The, 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 our sun will lose more than half of its mass, and all that will be left over is a dense core, a white dwarf. Um, and that star will have lost a lot of mass, which means everything that survives that phase, Mars will, will almost certainly survive that phase. Jupiter will certainly survive that phase. And lots of the asteroids in the asteroid belt, which are shown here on this diagram, will also survive. But if I go back in time, you'll notice that their orbits have changed. They've expanded. And any time those orbits change, uh, they get destabilized. Uh, our, our mass distribution in our solar system will have changed. Uh, that's not just true for the asteroids in our asteroid belt, but that's true for comets, Kuiper belt objects, Oort cloud objects, things that are much, much farther away in the outskirts of our solar system. And so they're going to get destabilized, and they will likely fall onto uh, the remaining star, the remaining white dwarf. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, is, is what we can learn about those surviving objects when they actually fall onto the white dwarf stars. So nothing is ever as simple as a cartoon. Um, but if I, I kind of jump back, uh, this is how we view white dwarf stars. So if you were to, to have an extremely powerful telescope, this, would, this is what a white dwarf would look like through about a three meter telescope uh, with a, a relatively wide field of view, uh, maybe uh, 20, 20 arc minutes on each side. Uh, this is how stars look to most astronomers, uh, they are just points of light. And so a lot of times we have to get creative about how we learn about those points of light. And I may be the only person talking about spectroscopy today, so I just wanna uh, mention that we can pass that starlight through a prism. So I wanna be inspired by the dark side of the moon. Uh, so the album cover for, for Pink Floyd's uh, album really, really helps bring to home, if you pass starlight through a prism, you can break that light up into its constituent colors and study the intensity of that light as a function of wavelength. Uh, so that can tell us a lot about stars. That can tell us a lot about white dwarfs. So everything I'm gonna talk about uh, in this talk will be using spectroscopy to analyze uh, white dwarf starlight. So the other important key thing to remember here is that every element in the periodic table from hydrogen and helium all the way down to uranium and plutonium, they all have their own fingerprint in light. That is the electrons in those atoms all have distinct energy level transitions that correspond to certain wavelengths. And so when you look at the spectrum of a star, when you pass that starlight through uh, a prism or a diffraction grating and you cause that light to interfere with itself, and that causes the light to spread out where you can measure the intensity as a function of wavelength, uh, you can learn what chemical elements are actually in those, those stars. And so I love this. You can actually buy this as a poster. It's actually kind of expensive. It's like $40 for a poster. But uh, I, I definitely, uh, I, I'm not getting a cut of this, but I love this poster because it, it shows you that each, each uh, element has its own fingerprint in light. Uh, sodium is usually a great thing to, to uh, refer folks to. Uh, street lamps uh, glow orange if they're sodium street lamps because they're just sodium in a tube that's getting lit up. Uh, and that's why they look orange. Uh, that is not going to be a relevant reference in five years because all of our street lamps are getting replaced by LED lights. And so they will no longer grow, grow naturally glow that, that orange. But, uh, but that's why sodium street lamps grow, glow orange. Um, so Mike gave a nice introduction about white dwarf structure and how white dwarfs are carbon oxygen core objects with, with these nice layers of, of helium and hydrogen on top of them. And I'll remind you that hydrogen, just like all other uh, elements, has specific transitions. We call these the Balmer series. They have specific transitions at specific wavelengths. And so when you go out and you pass white dwarf flight through a prism, this is what you see. You see very broad features only at wavelengths where you see hydrogen. 
And so if you were to look at uh, a hydrogen lamp with your eyes in op at optical wavelengths, you would see the Balmer uh, series, you would see Balmer transitions, you would see uh, what we call H alpha uh, in the red, H beta, and so on, higher and higher order series. And so here are sort of the bluer lines that you would see. Here's H beta. Uh, these are some of the lines Mike was showing with these laboratory experiments at Sandia. But you, you really only see hydrogen uh, in this spectrum at this resolution on this white dwarf. That's because the hydrogen has effectively bubbled up. All of the heavier elements have sunk down. This is a great diffusion problem. This is just like if you have some apple cider, all of the sediments sink down. Uh, and all you're left with is just this hydrogen at the surface. So the settling time for, for metals other than hydrogen uh, settle out of that uh, atmosphere of the white dwarf on a time scale shorter than years for, for most white dwarfs um, that we, we find in surveys. And so we expect to just see hydrogen because most of those heavier elements have sunk down. So white dwarfs have extremely strong surface gravities. They're extremely dense. So the surface gravity on a white dwarf is about 100,000 times stronger than here on Earth. So imagine what apple cider would look like on the surface of a white dwarf. I mean, things sink out very quickly. Uh, that's why you get these nice, strong, segregated layers. But when we go out and we actually measure the spectrum of lots and lots of white dwarfs, we don't just see hydrogen in their atmospheres. Many of these white dwarfs show transitions from lots of other metals in their atmospheres. So here you're seeing a white dwarf. Here's its name, GD362. You see the hydrogen, but you also see calcium and iron, magnesium, uh, you see lots of transitions from other elements in the atmosphere. And what we are very likely seeing is pollution of what should be a pristine white dwarf from surviving rocky material around that star. So here is the, the, here is the, the nutshell uh, story here. Uh, we're arguing that the pollution in these white dwarfs reveals the future of planetary systems around stars just like our sun. So we know planets are extremely common around other stars, thanks to missions like Kepler, now TESS. We're finding tons and tons of exoplanets. We have thousands of confirmed exoplanets now. So we know stars like our sun have planets. As that star evolves, the orbits of everything that survives, whether it's asteroids or planets or moons, all of those orbits are gonna expand because that star has lost mass, and that's gonna cause those orbits to become destabilized in some cases. And so some of that material is gonna scatter in. And so that, those ancient solar systems are gonna have some leftover debris. And if that debris gets scattered close enough to the white dwarf, it'll get ripped apart by the strong tides of the star. And then all that material will form a disk and eventually fall onto the leftover star. So Mark Garlick is a, um, He's an author, he's an illustrator. He makes a lot of great illustrations of these, these white dwarf systems. So I'm gonna give him credit for a lot of these, these great illustrations. But this picture has really been confirmed in a lot of different observational avenues over the last few decades. So this was really put forward uh, early on, several decades ago by several researchers at UCLA uh, and around the world. And eventually now we've, we've gotten enough evidence where not only do we see photospheric pollution, so if we take a spectrum of a white dwarf, we see calcium and, and iron and magnesium that should not exist in these stars, but it, it is there. And so it has to be raining onto those stars. Uh, and so that's the strongest line of evidence, but we also see infrared excesses around these stars, which we think is explained by there being dust disks. Not only do we see uh, big clouds of, of dust. In fact, we've actually taken spectra of some of these infrared features and they match bumps at about 10 microns, which is where we would expect olivine. Uh, these are uh, silicon oxide, uh, like, like uh, silicon oxides. So just like the green sand beaches in Hawaii, we can actually see spectral evidence of some of this dust around these white dwarfs that's getting ground apart from, from these bigger parent bodies. Uh, but even closer into the, the white dwarfs, we can see some of this material uh, as, as gas emission. And 
this material is not just existing at one wavelength. Some of that material is in the disk and that material is coming towards and away from us. And it's causing uh, these Doppler features where we have some of that gas moving towards us and some of it moving away from us. So we see that uh, in these, these three different lines of calcium, right? Uh, so I just wanna focus on, on these two dust and, and gas uh, disk lines of evidence. Uh, here's a cartoon showing Saturn and a white dwarf to scale. And so these disks of ripped apart rocky material around white dwarfs is on a very similar scale to the, the rings of Saturn. Uh, and so I, I have here two really nice reviews that were written in 2016 by Jay Farihi and Dimitri Veras. And Dimitri is actually on the call. Uh, and so Dimitri is, is, I would argue, the world expert uh, on uh, planets that survive main sequence evolution. Uh, and he is a fountain of information about all this. So if you find yourself in a uh, breakout room with Dimitri, make sure you pepper him with lots of questions because uh, he, is, he is very prolific. He writes several papers a year about this field. So uh, these white dwarfs show all these different lines of evidence. So what can we learn from, from these lines of evidence? Um, the first thing I wanna, I wanna mention is that just by measuring the abundances of this material, we can actually learn something about what is the bulk abundance of these rocks that are falling on white dwarfs. So if we look at different white dwarfs, we can compare their atmospheric compositions. We can assume that what is falling onto those stars is representative of, of the rocks that have been ripped apart. Remember, we only expect to see hydrogen in these white dwarfs. So all of the metals we see have to be coming from, from the rocks that are falling onto them. Um, Sean, I'm gonna save your question about how the rocks get there for, for a little while. Um, this is what the bulk Earth composition looks like. And it's dominated by four main elements. If you were to break apart our planet, the average composition of our planet it would really be dominated by oxygen, magnesium, silicon, and iron. That's not true for comets like Halley's Comet. That's mostly volatile rich. You see mostly oxygen and carbon, and then iron and silicon and magnesium. Uh, but here are, the, here are pie charts of the abundances of 10 different rocks that are falling on 10 different white dwarfs as we speak. This is from a paper uh, by C.E. Shu, who I'm showing on the bottom left just to show you that there's a big diversity in the types of rocks that fall onto white dwarfs, but these rocks look a lot like both the meteors and the bulk earth composition here in our solar system. I'm not sure if this music's coming through. I hope it's not, because it's kind of silly. Uh, comets crash into our sun all the time. So this, this destabilization of orbits is, is not uncommon. Uh, this happens in our solar system. Uh, comets can come and approach the sun from really high eccentricities. Uh, and so comets do crash into the sun all the time, but we can't really learn anything about the composition of those comets because they contribute so little to the overall composition of the sun that when a comet falls onto the sun, it really doesn't change the, the composition of the sun, the bulk composition of the sun very much. Um, I like to think of white dwarfs more like freshly laid snow where when these rocks are falling onto these, these white dwarfs, um, we're actually able to trace the footprints of that one rock because everything else will have sunk out of the atmosphere of that white dwarf very quickly. And so when we see those, those elements on the surface of the white dwarf, um, they are telling us that they are being put there in the moment. They are from uh, an, an asteroid or rocky body. Uh, so, so unlike you know, a trail in the woods that's been trod many times, you can't really you know, trace footprints on one of those trails. With white dwarfs, that's what it would be like for a star like the sun. We really can't learn about rocky material around normal sun-like stars. So we really need to look for places where it's kind of like a blank canvas. Uh, where, uh, where we can actually learn something about that rocky material. And so that's the big power we have here with white dwarfs is 
uh, we can actually constrain the abundances of the rocks that are falling onto those stars by looking, but just by taking a spectrum, we can we can pass that white dwarf light through a prism and compare the abundances. And they can tell us something about the diversity of rocks around these objects, but they can also tell us that the rocks around these objects are really no different than the rocks in our solar system. So a lot of these rocks that are falling onto white dwarfs, they look a lot like our bulk Earth composition. Uh, they look a lot like chondrites and other meteorites in our solar system. So what else can we do? Let's get even more exciting. Uh, let's think about all of the different molecules that could exist on a rocky body. So almost all of the rocks we know here on Earth are oxides, metal oxides, magnesium oxide, aluminum oxide, silicon oxide. That is how most of the rocks exist on, on our planet and on other planets in the solar system. So those are some molecules that are relevant. Um, volatiles are also relevant, like I mentioned with, with Halley's Comet. You have carbon dioxide. You could have carbon dioxide in ice form, so you could have CO2 ice. You could have water ice. And I hope you see where I'm, I'm going with this. If we start to think about the budgets for oxygen specifically, if we assume that all of these other elements are metal oxides, so the iron comes as iron oxide, the silicon comes as silicon oxide, the magnesium comes as magnesium oxide, we can build up in a, a budget for how much oxygen we expect. And I wanna just pick out one of these stars and you'll notice that the pi for oxygen is pretty big. It's much bigger than many of these other oxygen pies. And around this specific white dwarf, if we add up all of the oxygen that we'd expect to come from magnesium oxide or aluminum or silicon or calcium, from those elements that we see in that star, that makes up less than 50% of the oxygen budget that we see in this white dwarf. And so we can actually use these observations to say that there is so much oxygen, the abundance of oxygen compared to calcium, silicon, aluminum, magnesium, and all the other elements that, uh, all the other uh, atomic uh, elements that we see in this white dwarf, it has so little carbon that all of this excess oxygen is likely coming from water. And we can further estimate that that parent body was originally composed of at least 26% water by mass. So we're actually able to constrain the water mass fraction of some of these rocks that are falling on this white dwarf. So this was first done by Jay Farihi in, in 2013. It's been done for a few other white dwarfs. So it's not just a one-off. Um, a small fraction of these white dwarfs look like the material falling onto them is very water rich, which is really cool. Uh, the earth is relatively water poor um, for, for things in our solar system, right? Our oceans are, are make up a very, very small fraction of the, the bulk mass here on earth, right? So that's, that's really, really cool. So, um, we can say something about water on rocks outside of our solar system. Uh, and this is really one of the only ways we can, we can learn about um, what is the, the actual water mass fraction of, of things outside of our solar system. So I've highlighted a few of the elements in the periodic table I've been talking about just because they make the strongest transition at optical wavelengths where our instruments are most sensitive to make these measurements. Uh, but there's a whole periodic table of, of things that must exist in these rocks, but they probably exist in small enough concentrations that they just don't really stick out in our spectra. But it's amazing to think that, you know, we assume that these white dwarfs have hydrogen on the surface. Sometimes they have helium on the surface, but we're beginning to see carbon, oxygen, silicon, sulfur, iron, magnesium, and higher and higher concentrations. And, and really, these four elements, which are the same four elements that make up bulk Earth, 
that's what dominates the abundances of rocks around other stars and other solar systems. So I want to finish up talking about these two elements, lithium and beryllium, because over the last few years, uh, these are, uh, I say over the last few years, really over the last few months, uh, these two elements have been detected for the first time in white dwarfs, and they may say two really interesting things. So I'll start with lithium. Uh, and just this year, in a science paper led by a grad student at UNC, Ben Kaiser, uh, Ben used the, the four-meter sword telescope in Chile, and he identified this lithium line for the first time in a white dwarf. Now, lithium is really cool because lithium is not created in stars. So its abundance is set around the universe by the Big Bang. And so these white dwarfs that show lithium, been found uh, several, uh, they are very cool, therefore they are very old white dwarfs. And the hope is at some point these lithium abundances can say something about uh, lithium concentrations around stars that were formed at different ages. So our sun formed four and a half billion years ago. And over the next few years, hopefully we'll start to study these lithium abundances and learn more about how lithium um, is distributed among stars and, and rocks around, around our galaxy. Um, so that's not just true uh, for lithium. There's another element I'll get to, but I, I wanna talk about one other paper that, that very, very recently talked about lithium abundances in white dwarfs. So you'll notice in this star, not only was lithium detected, but so is sodium, so is potassium, so is magnesium, so is calcium. So there were other elements observed in this, this spectrum. And another group independently first found, uh, also found lithium in a handful of white dwarfs. So that's this, uh, this line right here. Um, but what this group did was compare that lithium abundance, and you have to scale it to something because we don't see hydrogen in, in, in these specific white dwarfs, they scaled it to sodium. And so they compared lithium to calcium and lithium to potassium. And so you can see the potassium line here in red. You can measure how abundant that line is by the depth of these absorption features. And so they basically compared the depth of these potassium features to the depth of the lithium features to the depth of the sodium features. And what they found is that the abundance of lithium to calcium in these rocks around these old white dwarfs looks very much like continental crust here on Earth. And so they made an argument, uh, like a lot of things in science, uh, People will, will argue about this argument. I know of several experts in the field who are skeptical of this argument, but uh, I know of other experts in the field who are less skeptical of the argument, um, that the lithium abundances in this white dwarf may be saying something uh, about how, how these rocks came about. And, and it may be that they're the ripped off parts of large planets that had crusts, and we're seeing just the crustal part of one of those large planets. Um, so just by measuring these abundances, we're, we're, we're trying to piece together where these rocks came from. And they may not just be normal asteroids, they may be fragments of larger planets. And I, 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 I saw some questions about uh, orbit expansion, and, and I, I wanna get into that in the questions, but um, you know, it's very likely that a very large rock collided with Earth in our history, and the, the fragments of that created our moon. And so it's very likely that if there is another phase of destabilized orbits in solar systems like our own, there will be planets to planet collisions or moon to planet collisions as these things get destabilized. And so it's not outside the realm of possibility to think that, you know, big bits of crust from these, these planets could get liberated and eventually find their ways to the white dwarfs. Okay, last slide. Um, beryllium is another element that was just this year published for the first time 
first in a paper by Beth Klein at UCLA, and then followed up theoretically by a grad student um, at UCLA. And beryllium is another one of those elements that is, is actually quite rare in stars. It's usually destroyed in stars. And the simplest way to form beryllium is actually through a process called spallation, which is taking heavier elements like oxygen and bombarding them with cosmic rays and causing that oxygen to actually fission. So you normally think of uranium or really, really heavy elements that can fission and break apart to make smaller elements in the periodic table. Uh, if you hit oxygen or nitrogen with cosmic rays, so high energy protons, uh, that can cause the oxygen to fission and, and form beryllium. And uh, this very recent theoretical paper by Doyle et al. in 2021 argues that perhaps the beryllium we're seeing in the rocks that are falling onto this polluted white dwarf are from rocks that existed around former giant planets. And maybe those rocks were even moons. And maybe that spallation uh, occurred at a very high rate because of the strong magnetic field of those giant planets. So some of the abundances and some of the moons, the ice moons around Jupiter and Saturn um, have high beryllium abundances. And so maybe this is evidence that the rocks we're seeing that are falling onto this white dwarf are from an icy moon from around a former giant planet. Cool. So uh, the bottom line here is that, that these alien rocks are, are just like rocks in our solar system. They're mostly composed of iron, oxygen, silicon, and magnesium. Uh, maybe some of, even, some of them even show evidence of an oxygen excess from, from water. Um, I am involved in, in research studies to try to find more and more white dwarfs that so transiting debris in front of these white dwarfs. This was found for the first time in 2015. And for the interest of time, because I, I'd really prefer to take some questions, although I can come back to this if, you have, if you'd like, like to talk about it. Um, we are finding more and more white, white dwarfs that are showing periodic dimming from big clouds of debris from rocks that are actively being ripped apart around the white dwarf in real time. And so we're seeing these white dwarfs dim on relatively short, like a few hour, or even relatively long, like a few hundred day time scale. So this was from a paper led by Zach Vanderbosch at UT Austin last year. Uh, but then another uh, student at UT Austin, Joseph Guidry, uh, has found uh, many more white dwarfs that show periodic transits uh, from these, this ripped apart debris. So that adds even more evidence to this idea that we're actually seeing rocks getting ripped apart in real time around these white dwarfs. So the last thing I'll mention is that James Webb Space Telescope, the successor to Hubble, much bigger, mostly infrared, will uh, launch Halloween of this year, hopefully, fingers crossed. Uh, and more than a day of JW, JWST time was recently awarded uh, to Susan Mulally and Fergal Mulally to look at four white dwarfs to try to find evidence of, of wide surviving planets around these white dwarfs. So stay tuned, hopefully we'll actually see some of these wide planets that survive stellar evolution and are actually kicking in the rocks that we see that pollute the white dwarfs now. So I'll leave up my conclusions and um, I would love to take uh, questions. Thank you. Great, JJ, thank you so much. Very, very cool. Um, okay, so questions for JJ, Destroyer of Worlds, Hermes. We had a few uh, questions on the on the chat, very interesting conversation uh, that maybe you can continue here. Uh, most of our people are interested on uh, the Maybe evolution. I should start in the chat. I, I saw there were yeah, a maybe, few maybe, questions maybe about... Maybe bring up a couple of pointers. Um, so there's definitely discussion about the evolution of uh, um, the orbits of planets under the effect of both uh, tides and uh, the expansion. Maybe and a mass good... Yeah. Let me just end up here. Robert, do you want to go ahead? Uh, 
I was wondering what happens to the magnetic field energy of the planets that get ripped apart? You know, I realized that when I played my movie, I muted myself and I didn't hear any of your questions just then. And if there were questions over the last minute, I did not hear them. So I apologize if there was like this weird. <laughs> uh, so sorry, could. Uh... I, I was wondering uh, what happens to the magnetic field energy of the planets that get ripped up? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, presumably it is it is relatively small compared to um, the scales involved. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, there, there, as far as I know, uh, there haven't been a lot of, of in-depth studies about uh, what, how the magnetic field of whatever surviving object that makes it onto the white dwarf uh, could impart uh, more energy to that white dwarf. I, I think the important thing to, to say here is that we think based on a few different lines of evidence that the mass of the objects involved in the accretion of the rocks that we see are relatively small. So probably of masses of things smaller than the moon. And most, most objects, most, like our moon is not magnetic, not strongly magnetic. It just doesn't have a, a big, you know, molten core to generate a dynamo to generate a big global magnetic field. And so odds are most of the things that we see that make their way into the white dwarf uh, probably don't have very strong magnetic fields. They're probably pretty small. Um, so we have, uh, Robert just passed and we have Sean and then Vince. Sean, take it away. Thank you so much. That was really exciting. Um, uh, I was just wondering, can you tell me, do the white dwarfs have crust? Are they going to have like geological processes that are happening? Um, is any of the, the material that you see in the surface coming from inside or is it just, you, there's no mechanism that you can think of for that? No, so so there, there's there's two things happening here. So um, this material that's that's raining onto the star will set up. We we pick white dwarfs specifically that do not have convection zones at their surface, because as those convection zones. So just like our sun, uh, there's a large uh, region at the surface of the star where convection is doing the energy transport, and if a convection zone on a white dwarf star gets deep enough, it can start to dredge up material, heavier elements like carbon. And in fact, we definitely see that in some cool white dwarfs, but that's at temperatures, surface temperatures below six or 7,000 degrees is where we start to see, uh, that, that's, the, that's the relevant temperature range where those white dwarfs can start to dredge up uh, heavier material. So we, we specifically try to pick white dwarfs that are in the temperature range where we know those convection zones are not really relevant to, to bringing up material. Great, thank you, thank you. That's very exciting to see the water though. That's really amazing. Cool. Vince. Uh, yeah, uh, I was wondering if you can see the sort of the history of planet formation uh, by looking at how old the white dwarfs are, and the oldest ones wouldn't have had planets because there wouldn't, or at least not rocky planets, because those elements didn't exist yet. Yeah, newer newer ones would. I mean, this is a fantastic question. So, uh, the the complicating factor here, I I want to get back to this idea about like sort of the cartoon picture. So as this star loses mass. These orbits expand to conserve angular momentum because the central mass is, is now less. Um, over time, these orbits, the, the star no longer loses mass, and so they should start to relatively stabilize. But uh, there, there are still dynamical processes, and, and, and it's all about the dynamics that's kicking this stuff in over time. And so you have an expectation that over time, there will be less and less material to kick in over time. So there's some e-folding time scale where the dynamics dictate how fast stuff gets kicked in. And that's actually been constrained by looking at what is the fraction of white dwarfs as a function of temperature that show metal pollution. And the e-folding time scale is a little more than a billion years, but it's probably less than 2 billion years. And so just 
from 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 that, that that's what's really driving why the older and cooler white dwarfs uh, uh, tend to show less pollution because more of that material has been scattered out. So that's the complicating factor. But but you know, at some level, there is signal there where perhaps the oldest stars in our galaxy have uh, a much lower planet occurrence rate and therefore should have lower pollution rates. Uh, so it'd be really cool if we could constrain it that way, but uh, yeah. Like, like a lot of things in science, there's some, there's some complicating factor in the way that's, that's affecting that signal. Right, um, Nicole. Well, um, I'm wondering about the planetary nebula when it forms after the red giant phase, how large that is and like what's the difference on the impact of things inside of that versus outside of the planetary nebula? Yeah, that's a great question. The, the planetary nebula, the material uh, that makes up the planetary nebula, as you go further and further away from the central star, the less and less dense it gets. And the less dense it is, the less it really matters in the grand scheme of things. So right now, our sun is actually losing a lot of material. There is a solar wind. We heard a little bit about the question uh, to Mike in the first session about uh, gyrochronology and how stars spin down. That's exactly why stars spin down is because they have this slow wind and the magnetic field acts to break on that wind. Um, but the solar winds, uh, well, fortunately for us, our planet has a nice magnetic field that protects us from that wind. But um, you know, the further and further away you get from the sun, the less and less that solar wind matters. Uh, it's a lot like that with the planetary nebula. So this planetary nebula can extend out. I love how I'm extending my arms here like it really matters. Um, to, to really, really huge distances, far outside of Pluto's orbit in our, our solar system. But the material is just so, uh, it, it's just so under dense that it, it really doesn't affect any sort of planetary orbits. But uh, yeah, so, th so that's why we think things like planets like Jupiter will, will be relatively unaffected by the sun's eventual evolution, not just into a red giant phase, but, but into any other uh, planetary nebulae phases. Phases like that where where the the, the outer layers are, are shed and then get get lit up by the very very hot exposed core of the star. So that's effectively what's happening in that planetary nebula phase. Is you get a lot of high energy radiation from that two hundred thousand degree exposed core of the star, and so it lights up all of that that mass that's lost. Great. Okay. It seems like there are no more questions, so I think it's also a good time to transition to our next speaker. Um, thanks again, JJ.